An American worker named George had his sights set on a comfortable retirement. Perhaps some holidays in the sun, relaxing in the garden with good novels and a gin and tonic by his side. And then when the company he worked for, the energy giant called Enron Corporation, collapsed in front of his eyes, those plans went up in smoke. Years later, he was mowing pastures when he should have been living on his retirement savings, which had mostly been tied up in Enron company stock. No one ever thought such a behemoth of a company could just go belly up. It was a story that shocked the world, one involving mismanagement, corruption, and greed. This is what happened. In its heyday, Enron was one of the largest companies in the USA. At its peak, its shares reached $90.75, and when it declared bankruptcy in 2001, they were worth 26 cents. Few saw it coming, and to this day, the downfall is a reminder to all of us that indeed, giants can fall. And on top of that, giants aren't always what they seem. The story starts in 1985 when two companies merged. They were Texas-based Houston Natural Gas Company and Omaha-based Internorth Incorporated. At the beginning, the new Enron was simply a very big natural gas supplier, but then in 1989 it turned a leaf in its book and began trading natural gas commodities. In 1994, it also began trading electricity. These changes took place under its new CEO, Kenneth Lay, who had formerly been in the big chair at Houston Natural Gas. At the time, Enron was said to be one of the most innovative companies in the USA, but at the time of the downfall, the New York Times wrote, Enron is a new economy company, a thinking outside the box, paradigm-shifting, market-making company. It added to the end of that paragraph, it's also at this point in time, a bankrupt company. As the story goes, before Enron got started, gas and electricity were produced and sold by state-regulated monopolies. But then there was deregulation and as the Times writes, Enron used Wall Street magic to transform energy supplies into financial instruments that could be traded online like stocks and bonds. Prior to this, those energy monopolies were always under government scrutiny. But after deregulation, Enron had more freedom and so started trading energy online such as stocks and bonds, and also placing bets on future energy prices. Enron started selling contracts called energy derivatives to investors. Soon, Enron was called America's most innovative company, and it won that accolade for a number of years. At the time, this looked good for the consumer, because with supply and demand taking over fixed prices by monopolies, the prices for customers seemed fair. It seemed like a dream story for capitalism. There was a problem though, and something didn't quite add up. You see, Enron thought that if it could trade energy, then why not trade all kinds of other things, such as insurance or advertising, and then turn these into contracts and sell them as derivatives too. The company poured billions into these new trading ventures, but not everything turned into gold. It later turned out that while Enron was winning on some levels, it was losing on others. But the problem was it wasn't always coming clean about where it was losing. It was kind of fixing its accounts and reporting false trading revenues. As one person pointed out, some of the schemes traders used including serving as middlemen on contract trade, linking up a buyer and a seller for a future contract, and then booking the entire sale as Enron revenue. Enron was also using its partnerships to sell contracts back and forth to itself and booking revenue each time. It was, in fact, creating imaginary revenues. If that's confusing to you, the Wall Street Journal gave an example of one such piece of Enron subterfuge. Enron got into a deal with Blockbuster. Those guys whose stores you go into in the past and rent out a movie? The new deal with Blockbuster was to do this online, but it didn't work out and in 8 months the business was a total flop. While this was going on, Enron had made a deal with a Canadian bank. If the bank loaned Enron $115 million, Enron would then hand over its video deal profits for the first 10 years to the bank. As you know, Enron made no cash from this online video renting business with Blockbuster, but it still wrote the $115 million down as part of its revenue, not a massive loss. The Canadian bank was owed money, but on paper things didn't look bad for Enron. According to the New York Times, Enron did a fair bit of shady accounting, and still Wall Street bankers at JP Morgan and others were gung-ho about the company and its stock. Some people, however, began to smell a rat. The thing was, Enron was also seen as a fairy tale winner in the years when deregulation and online trading, embodied by a get-rich-quick culture, were admired by everyone. Leave the innovators alone, this is the future. But things got out of hand as they tend to do when in Hobbesian terms the Leviathan goes missing and no one's watching over the people to ensure nothing terrible is happening. Enron also invested heavily in high-speed broadband telecom networks, but the company saw no profits from that either. 
The most innovative company in America was on a losing streak, but still those losses were not reported. It was hiding all its financial losses using something called mark-to-market accounting. Investopedia explains that like this. This technique measures the value of a security based on its current market value instead of its book value. This can work well when trading securities, but it can be disastrous for actual businesses. Another example given of the Enron way of hiding its losses is this. If the company bought a power plant, it would first put the projected profit on its books. That's a projected profit, meaning nothing has actually been made. If then Enron actually didn't make a profit but a loss, it would transfer the loss to an off-the-books corporation somewhere no one would find it. This way, Enron's bottom line didn't look affected and everyone still thought the company was booming, when in fact heavy losses were being incurred and then hidden like soiled underwear at the bottom of a laundry basket. Enron used something called Off-Balance Sheet Special Purpose Vehicles or SPVs to hide these failures. But all you need to know is that this is a technique that can be used to fool investors and creditors. The experts tell us this is not illegal, but it can be dangerous. At the same time, not everyone understands how they work, so it could be said to be slightly unethical if companies are not completely transparent about it. And then the bubble burst, as bubbles tend to do. By April 2001, analysts were on to Enron. They saw what was happening, realizing that accounting wizardry had been creating a company not unlike the fantasy city of Oz. Behind the screen, Enron was crumbling, and by summer 2001 the company was in free fall. Its stock was downgraded, sinking like a stone into the abyss. By 2000, it was revealed that Enron had losses of $591 million and $628 million in debt. In 2001, the company filed for bankruptcy, and a lot of poor folks whose pensions were tied up in company stock were going to have to cancel their dream vacation in the Caribbean. From 2004 to 2011, the company paid $21.7 billion to its creditors. It said shareholders lost in total around $74 billion, and employees lost billions in pension benefits, with one such person being the guy we mentioned at the beginning of the story. There were many, many more like him. Some of the executives were charged with conspiracy, insider trading, and securities fraud. The CEO we mentioned died of a heart attack before he could face any prison time. Others did time for facilitating corrupt business practices. Another CEO, Jeffrey Skilling, was only just released from prison. Do you think government regulation of markets is good or bad after watching this video? Let us know in the comments. Also, check out our other video, How Jeff Bezos Gets His Money from Amazon. Thanks for watching and as always don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you next time.